The following sections are designed to review the initial chapters of the latest PHTLS text and course. Viewing this video should not be a substitute for reviewing the in-depth information found in the textbook. Reviewing these sections, completing the test questions after each portion, and reading through the book will give you an introduction into the theory and initial assessment concepts the PHTLS course uses. You will then need to attend the skill stations, secondary lectures, and testing stations in order to be eligible to take the PHTLS exams. PHTLS is based on the Physician's Trauma Program, ATLS, by the College of Surgeons. Lesson 1. Introduction and Overview of Trauma Care and PHTLS. In the United States, over 60 million injuries occur annually. 40 million of those result in emergency department visits, and this does not include visits to private doctors, clinics, and other health care providers. Two and a half million of those injuries result in hospitalization, and over nine million people each year become disabled, most of them temporarily. However, about three to four hundred thousand a year become permanently disabled, resulting in a large expense to the health care system and the workforce. In the United States, 179,000 people each year die from trauma, and it is the leading cause of death for persons between the age of 1 and 44 years of age. In fact, throughout all of life, trauma is in the top five leading causes of death from birth till death. 80% of teenage deaths occur during this time, and 60% of childhood deaths occur as a result of trauma. And it costs the United States approximately $685 billion a year between loss and disability. The goal of PHTLS is to help reduce mortality and morbidity from trauma and to help provide the knowledge and skills for all pre-hospital trauma team members. It also is a goal to help deliver the appropriate care to the trauma patient in the field in a timely fashion, giving the appropriate care no less and no more. Trauma care should be and is currently based on research. Evidence-based medicine is the gold standard for setting standards and goals and objectives in treating trauma patients. Interventions are based on the assessment of each patient, which we will talk about later. Delivering the trauma patient is important that we deliver with the right interventions to the right facility using the right mode of transport, whether that be ambulance or helicopter, or in some cases, boat, etc. In the right amount of time, in a quick, safe manner, as quickly as possible and as safely as possible with the right interventions done for this patient. If you have taken ITLS in the past or recently graduated from a paramedic program, you may notice some differences between these and PHTLS. PHTLS has a few minor terminology changes, which we will go over during the program, but also uses slightly different numbers in relation to things like shock and ventilations. For patients who have hypotension, uncontrolled bleeds should get fluids until the pressure is between 80 and 90 milligrams. And if there's a head injury, the pressure should be maintained at least 90 millimeters of mercury or greater. ITLS and some paramedic programs stress between 110 and 120 millimeters of mercury. Ventilations are very similar, although for patients who have intracranial pressure and signs of impending herniations, ventilation should be at a rate of 20 breaths per minute. Impending herniation includes Cushing's, posturing, sluggish or non-reactive pupils, Glasgow Coma Scale drop by two points or more, or developing hemiplegia or hemiparesis. We will discuss these when we talk about head injuries and shock. The team approach is very important to PHTLS and to all patient trauma care. This starts with the citizens who first notice the injuries, who then call 911. Dispatch will activate the EMS system. This includes fire and EMS, sometimes separately, sometimes together. Transport services in those places that use a third tier service. The emergency department the patient will be transported to. The surgical division of the hospital, OR, trauma surgery, where the surgery or the actual fixing of the trauma will take place. But other specialty services as well, including rehabilitation. Communication is very important as well. It needs to be done in a timely manner, should be done verbally, between you and the hospital, but should also include your written component, which generally is the patient care report. Clear, concise, and accurate, complete communication is very important because it helps not only transfer the care from you to the hospital, but it also allows optimal care at the facility that the patient is receiving this care at. For PHTLS, it builds upon your current knowledge base and skills to enhance critical thinking and problem solving. 
it is very important in trauma that we be flexible in our thinking and that we be able to solve problems because a lot of times we can't see exactly what's happening inside of the patient. Teamwork is very important because together as a team, with the combined knowledge, skills, and resources that we have, our overall patient care will be much better and a structured environment to practice the trauma and treatment skills that you're going to learn in this course. In trauma care, a principle is what needs to be done for a patient based upon the assessment. The preference is how the principle is accomplished. This could be something as simple as oxygenation. We may want to oxygenate the patient, but can it be accomplished through bag valve mask? Does it need to be accomplished through a non-rebreather mask? Does the patient need to be intubated? All are methods of ventilating the patient but a lot depends upon the patient's presentation, the situation that you find, what happens to the patient, and sometimes things change which requires a change in procedure. Also the knowledge and skill level that is present at the time may dictate what type of procedure will be done and the resources that you have available to you. Trauma care is very importantly based on assessment. It begins before you reach the patient using the information that's provided from the caller or from dispatch. So if we have a vehicle accident that involves multiple fatalities or multiple patients, we may send more ambulances or more uh, rescue vehicles. We may have to notify hazardous materials, police. We may put the helicopter on standby if it's a situation or in a location that uh, may require a long extrication or a long transport time. We want to make sure that the scene is safe, that we have enough available resources to treat the patients, and also how many patients do we have that need to be treated and what is their acuity level. The mechanism of injury or what PHTLS calls kinematics is also very important and we will discuss that later in this presentation. For each patient we want to do what's called a primary assessment. You may know that as a rapid trauma survey or rapid trauma assessment. We want to do a secondary assessment and we also want to reassess our injuries and our vital signs for the patient that we are treating. In the patient assessment, the primary assessment uses the A, B, C, D, E approach. And even though we teach that in alphabetical order, a lot of times this is done simultaneously or with multiple people checking things at the same time. It is at this point that we want to assess and correct any immediate life threats that exist. Airway issues, ventilation issues, uncontrolled hemorrhage, neurological impairment, those things need to be fixed immediately if they're going to have an impact on the patient's life. The secondary assessment, or what's typically called the head-to-toe assessment, is going to look for all the other injuries that exist, but are usually not life-threatening for the patient. These may include contusions, abrasions, maybe small fractures like a fractured wrist, fractured hand, fractured forearm, those that are important, but not going to kill your patient. We also want to get a measurement of the vital signs as early as possible to get a baseline set of vitals to compare later to notice whether there are any changes in blood pressure, heart rate, ventilations, etc. The patient assessment reassessment is very important to determine if there are any changes in response to the injuries that the patient has or in the treatment that we're providing. Changes in patient condition such as decreasing blood pressure, increasing heart rate, decreasing mentation or level of consciousness, uh, changes in uh, O2 saturation or CO2, those can all give us an indication that the patient may be getting worse or if we're providing oxygen, if we're providing fluid, we want to check those blood pressures or ventilations to see if they're improving to know that our treatment is being beneficial for the patient. It is also important in the reassessment to determine if there's any change in the patient's status because this may dictate further treatment that may be required to help the patient. The primary assessment should be done at the scene before you're en route to the hospital. It is at this point that you should know exactly what to do and what not to do because some things are more important than others. You must be very focused and you must pay very close attention to exactly what needs to be done in the quickest amount of time before we start moving the patient and transporting. It is at this point that things that get missed may become crucial for your patient. The secondary assessment would be done in route to the hospital on a priority patient or may be done at the scene if time allows. Sometimes in priority patients, depending on your length of transport, you may not have time to do a secondary assessment. If airway needs to be done, intubation, IVs, fluid, those should be done before secondary assessments. 
Remember, the secondary assessment is only to look for things that are not life-threatening for your patient. The primary assessment findings are those that are crucial to saving your patient's life, not the secondary assessment. Transport should be considered early. If you have a long distance to a trauma center, you may want to consider putting the helicopter on standby. Helicopters do not just immediately take off and land. They need to do a pre-flight uh, check. They'll also need to get up, over, land, and an LZ would need to be set up for these. And so they take some time. Ground transport, depending on the weather, may be a better solution than air transport, depending on distance, travel, and et cetera. Also, is this an emergent patient? Is this a priority patient? Or is this a patient who has minor injuries where length of transport will not be as big an effect on their outcome? And most importantly, we need to transport the patient to the appropriate destination. Trauma patients should go to trauma facilities that handle that type of trauma. Pediatric patients should be at pediatric trauma centers. Adult patients need to be at adult trauma centers. The closest available hospital is not necessarily the best treatment for that patient. Some of the pitfalls that you might see, not having a safe scene. This can be dangerous for you and a continuing danger for not only you, but other bystanders, other personnel on the scene who may not be involved with patient care, such as the police, such as tow truck drivers, and other witnesses or bystanders. Overlooking those life threats that you may find in the primary assessment because you did not do an adequate assessment or didn't expose the patient and miss something underneath their clothing. Focusing on those distracting, non-life-threatening injuries. The open fracture of the wrist may be easily visible, but the bruising and contusion to the abdomen is the more life-threatening issue. Performing a secondary assessment before you fixed all of the life threats. The airway needs to be secured and maintained, they need to be properly ventilated, they need to have adequate circulation, and that is our important priorities for this patient. Fixing a broken wrist or a broken ankle is not going to take precedence over somebody not breathing or having poor blood pressure or circulation. Priority assessment focuses on the primary airway breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. The ABCDE always comes first and should be fixed first before we fix any of the secondary findings. Some other pitfalls include performing advanced interventions before the basic procedures are done. Intubation needs to be done, but nobody has a non-rebreather or nobody has a bag valve mask being used on the patient. We're starting an IV, but yet we haven't controlled the hemorrhage. Those are the important things that need to be fixed. BLS before ALS. Not performing the secondary assessment when it's appropriate and if you have the time. It is okay not to do the secondary assessment if you have a very short transport time and you do not have time to do the assessment. But if you have the time, the secondary assessment should be performed. And staying on scene too long, usually due to either doing too many procedures on scene or not finding out fast enough which patients need to be transported quickly. There are times where you will be prolonged on scene, such as delayed extrications, delayed access to the patient, etc. But once those patients are found, primary assessment, determine the life threats, and start transport as quickly as possible on these patients. Some other things you might find, overlooking signs of deterioration, not monitoring your patient continuously throughout the transport. Watch for signs of changes in their mental status. Watch for signs of changes in the blood pressure, EKG, skin color and temperature, etc. By not reassessing that patient continuously, reassessing the injuries and reassessing our treatments, we are setting ourselves up to miss something which may be critical for our patient. And transport the patient to the right facility. Transporting them to a facility that cannot handle that patient will delay their care and could lead to the patient's death. As far as prevention goes, the Centers for Disease Control considers trauma to be a disease. It is therefore preventable, and we, especially healthcare providers who are out with the public all the time, should be helping to provide training for those people. Everyone from the small child who should be taught to wear helmets, seatbelts, etc., to even the parents who should be taught when the child should be in a car seat, when it's okay for them to ride in the front seat versus the back seat, and when they should be wearing helmets but also the elderly patients. They fall, rugs, hazards at home. These are all things because we are in these patients' homes or we are at their houses or we are at their car accidents. That is a time to help train and teach people 
to help prevent these from happening later. You should also be advocates and active participants in trauma prevention programs, drowning prevention, helmets, etc. All of these things are designed to help prevent trauma. It is through your eyes and your training and experience that this can be noticed and this can be helped to teach and prevent further trauma to these patients. In conclusion, trauma is preventable and it is our job and duty to help notify, teach, and train people how to prevent it. When it occurs, it is our job to identify and treat the patients appropriately, transporting them to the appropriate facility as quickly as possible, doing the appropriate treatments that were required. No more, no less. At this time, please complete the questions for this section.